I will be reading Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 16. Uh, the title is Unity and Maturity in the Body of Christ. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of this, the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you are called to one hope when you are, were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to teach one of us grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, and the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ of, may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds up itself in love as each part does its work. Amen. I'm privileged to uh, be able to speak to you today. And uh, what I like about Sunday morning is that I get two chances to try and get it right, okay? <laughs> and you'll notice that my title is, you know, a Great Commission Church is a church where all members are ministers. And it's sort of focused around Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. <clears throat> and... Uh, some of you realize that we're working through a whole series called, the, you know, where we want to be a great commission church. And uh, these are, each message sort of focuses on uh, different characteristics of what it means to be a great commission church. <clears throat> and uh, if you look at the insert, I put right up front what I'm trying to communicate, okay? That's just in case you miss it. You can read it there. Okay, and it's, you know, each believer has been given a spiritual gift or gifts and a calling in order to serve others. As disciples of Jesus, we are called to be good stewards of our gifts and callings. Christ desires to continue his ministry on earth through the church, his body on earth. So you'll be able to tell me at the end if I succeeded. Okay, at uh, what I'm trying to communicate. <clears throat> but in the book of Acts, you know, remember Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and he wrote the book of Acts. It's almost as if he wrote a book with two parts. There's the Gospel, the book of Luke, and there's Acts. And at the very beginning of Acts, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, he says, the former things I've written to you, O Theophilus, about how Jesus began to do and to teach. And then he goes on. And the implication is that the Gospels tell us what Jesus began to do and to teach, and Acts tells us what Jesus continued to do and to teach through the apostles and through the disciples of Jesus. Okay? And that includes you know, us you know, all the way to today. Okay? So... Uh, <clears throat> You see, Jesus, before he, he died, he said he was going to leave the disciples and he was going to go to the Father. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, he left believers to be his church on earth. And Paul calls it the body of Christ. And so Jesus continues his ministry through his body here on earth, every believer. And... Uh, <clears throat> 
the Holy Spirit has been, you know, Jesus said the Holy Spirit would be given to us as a paraclete. Now, there's no word in English that, that translates the word paraclete. You know, it's one who comes alongside to help in whatever way you know, is needed. And the New Testament tells us multiple ways that the Holy Spirit helps us uh, here. And Jesus said, I'm going to send to you another paraclete. Now, Jesus was a paraclete a helper to the disciples. He was going to the Father. He was going to send another paraclete, the Holy Spirit, to help us. And one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to reproduce in his children, to re reproduce in us the character of Jesus, to make us more and more like Jesus, to make us holy in our lives. But another work of the Holy Spirit is to reproduce in us the ministry of Jesus. Now, Jesus was was perfect in every form of ministry. And the, 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 the New Testament doesn't promise to give every Christian all of the gifts of ministry. You know, but to give to different ones different ministries so that together we complement each other in continuing the ministry of Jesus. And his ministry was, was, was multiple. You know, he didn't just preach. You know, he taught and he helped the sick, and he fed the hungry, you know, a, a, a very wide variety of ministry. So we are going to try and focus on, you know, what the gifts of the Spirit, the gifts that Jesus has given to his followers, to the church, so that we can continue his ministry here on earth. <clears throat> There's a church in, in New England by the name of St. Paul's Church in Darien, Connecticut. I don't know if it's still true, but it used to be that their bulletin, on the front of their bulletin, they had written rector. You know what a rector is? Yeah, we call them pastors. Okay, rector, so-and-so. Associate rector, so-and-so. And then it says ministers the entire congregation. You know, and I like that. You know, that is biblical. Uh, and we're going to see that uh, as, as we go along. <clears throat> but uh, it's in, you know, the, the passage we want to focus on is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 16, which introduces the subject of, of spiritual gifts. And I'm not going to do a very thorough job of explaining, expounding this whole passage because we don't have enough time. But I want to, you know, show where spiritual gifts fits into God's plan. So we're going to look at the whole passage, and we're going to look at what it says about spiritual gifts, and then we're going to expand on spiritual gifts. And then I'm going to get you guys to talk, okay? I'm going to save the last 10 or 15 minutes for, for your reaction. And, you know, I'm not going to let you, well, you can ask me questions, but I have some questions for you, Okay. So that's where we're headed. <clears throat> now, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, and uh, you have it in your insert, and I think it's up there, uh, and uh, this is the way Paul begins the passage. He says, <clears throat> As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. So, the first three chapters of Ephesians, Paul has explained our calling, what God has called us to. And he explains how God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. He explains how, how God raised Christ to, from the dead and, and you know, showed his, demonstrated his power in putting him above all principalities and powers and making him head of the church. And he goes on to explain how God has raised us. You know, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and God has raised us up in Christ and give us a new life. And he's even made us to sit together in heavenly places with Christ. I don't know what that means totally, but, uh, you know, it's wonderful, whatever it is. And, uh, and then uh, he talks about the church. You know, in the first chapter of Ephesians, Paul says that God has led us into what he's doing in the world, you know, what his ultimate plan is. 
and his ultimate plan is to unite all things under Christ, uh, the headship of Christ. <clears throat> and uh, you know, so he's uniting everything under the headship of Christ. And the first step, you know, the first part of uniting all things under Christ, Paul explains, is the church. Through or Jesus has created a new society, a new tribe, a new humanity. The first humanity was started by Adam and Eve, but sin came in and has brought you know, chaos and division and death and sickness into this world. And, uh, and now Jesus has come and he started a new humanity. And he bridged the gap, the, the greatest divide in history, according to the Bible, was the divide between Jew and Gentile. Part of this divide was due to the pride of the Jewish people. But part of it was because God put it there. God said that they, they should be a distinct people. And through this nation, he was going to bring the, 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 the Messiah. And now... God is doing something new. Before the coming of Christ, if you wanted to wholeheartedly follow God, you needed to become a Jew. You needed to become circumcised. You needed to, be, to, to follow all the laws of the Old Testament. But now with the coming of Christ, things had changed. In the book of Acts, we see this change. And you know, through Paul, we see this change. That no longer are the, is the people of God a nation, Israel, but now the people of God is a, you know, the church made up of many nations. And no longer does a person have to come to Christ, you know, to come to Christ and become a Jew in order to be a part of the people of God. And Paul, you know, preached this and he lived this. And he's writing in Ephesians from prison because he insisted that Gentiles do not have to become Jews in order to follow Christ. Okay? And so Paul was in prison for you and for me. You know, if, if he hadn't stood strong on this, and if you know, the Judaizers had succeeded in convincing everybody that Christians, new Gentiles, needed to become Jews first, Christianity would have remained a small sect in Judaism. But now it's become a worldwide thing. And so we can be thankful for what God did through the Apostle Paul. So... <clears throat> now, Paul is coming and he says, you know, I'm writing to you in the second half of Ephesians, uh, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Okay, it, what he's saying is, now the next three chapters I'm going to tell you how to live in a way that fits all that God has done for you. And the first thing he targets is the church. And he talks about the unity of the church. You see, if God is going to unite everything under Christ and he's starting with people and he desires that the church show the unity and the love you know, for God and how we work together and love one another, you know, that's where he starts. And he explains what that means in practical terms. And here's where gifts, spiritual gifts come in. And then he goes on to talk about you know, living in, in the light of that calling involves relationships. You know, what kind of relationships are, you know, fit with our high calling in terms of the love of a husband for his wife, in terms of parents for children, in terms of, you know, uh, bosses for workers, in terms of our conduct, you know, what kind of conduct fits with our high calling. So that's the rest of the book. But we're going to, you know, sort of target the first part when he talks about the church. And this is what he says. He begins... In verse 2 of chapter 4, be completely humble and gentle, <clears throat> be patient, bearing one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So I would suggest to you that the very first thing that he, he talks about here is the environment for the church, the environment for community. And uh, the environment is love. And he talks about, uh, you know, this is the soil in which the church grows best. And he, talk, he talks about four different qualities. Be humble, be gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Okay, these qualities, for example, of be humble, 
and be gentle. You know, in the Greek world and the Roman world, those were signs of weakness. But in the kingdom of God, those are signs of strength. And I said that in the early service, and uh, later Joe came to me and said, you know, those are also signs of weakness in our culture. You know, humble and, <laughs> and gentle. You know, gentleness is not weakness. It's strength under control. And the Bible, you know, says that Moses was the meekest man in all the earth. Now, Moses was a tower of strength, but he was the meekest man in all the world. And, and you know, be humble. You know, if you look at churches that divide, that, that fight, if you look deep enough, you'll find, normally you'll find a lack of humility. You know, uh, <laughs> you'll find pride. And then he talks about be patient, bearing with one another in love. How many of you know that we haven't really, you know, become all that we're supposed to be? Huh? You know, and, and, you know, the New Testament, you know, God realizes that we need, we have a long ways to go. And we need to learn to be patient with one another, to love one another, to bear with one, one another's weaknesses. Okay, so in this soil of humility, in the soil of gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, then unity can blossom. Secondly, Paul goes on in, this, in, in verses 4 and 5. He says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you are called by one hope when you are called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. You see how many ones there are there? Huh? There are seven ones. You know, and John Stott points out that each one relates to one member of the, the Godhead. In other words, our unity is rooted in the unity of God. And you know, we don't have the time to go into all of these ones. You know, but you know, for example, you know, when it says one faith, is it talking about our faith in Jesus, or is it talking about you know, what we believe? You know, we could discuss that at some length. Or when it says one hope, you know, what hope is he talking about? The hope of our calling, the hope that we have of being glorified with Christ. Anyway, you see, all of these ones, you know, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, probably referring not to water baptism, but baptism by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And so this is the, you know, the church of every true Christian is one with every other true Christian you know, in seven different ways. You see how much grounds for unity we have. You know, just think of that. You know, if, if we had the time to spell out the implications of this, I don't know where we'd go. But uh, it means that you know, people in all kinds of churches and denominations, if they truly believe in Jesus and follow him, we are united with them. So often we, we talk about the little differences and we make huge you know, things out of the little differences. You know, they you know, baptize babies and we don't believe in that. Or you know, they you know, have modern music and we stick with the, the real Christian music. And you know, <laughs> they are uh, liturgical and we are freestyle. You know, and we make a big deal out of these minor things, and yet we have seven things in common with every other Christian. So we have the basis for unity. But that's not all. You know, Paul says that we have a responsibility to do everything we can to maintain unity of the Spirit, because we are demonstrating for Christ to the world what this new society is like. What is it like to live under the Lordship of Jesus here in this earth? Okay. So now Paul goes on, and now he's going to talk about, you know, spiritual gifts. Okay, verse 7. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. In other words, Christ has given grace. And in the context, he goes on to talk about spiritual gifts. It's grace to serve God in different ways. And in verse 11, he goes on to say, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Now, if you look in your, in your insert, you'll notice that after verse 7, 
But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it, dot, dot, dot. What that says is I left out three verses, okay? And the reason I left that out, <laughs> is, it, um, is this making too much noise? Uh, anyway, what? It should be up. You think that's better? Okay. I think we have a technician. We're gonna double you up here. Wow, I've never had double the power, you know. <laughs> sort of like Elisha, you know, double mantle. <laughs> Okay, so these three dots, I'll tell you why I left them out. Because for me to explain these three verses would take me 15 minutes, okay? They are the hard, some of the hardest verses to interpret in the Bible. Now, don't you like it when a, when a pastor, when a preacher comes to the hard verses and skips them? You know, uh, but... <laughs> Let me, let me read it to you, okay? Uh, he says, this is, this is what Paul says. He says, to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. Now he quotes from the Old Testament, Psalms, and he uses that to support this statement that Christ has given gifts to each of us. And this is what he, what he says about, from quoting the Old Testament. He says, this is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So you see why I left it out, right? Uh, you know, I have, you know, a commentary by, by F.F. F. Bruce, a, a real scholar on the New Testament. Another commentary by, by John Stott. And you know, F.F. F. Bruce takes two and a half pages in this small commentary to explain these, these three verses. And, and, and uh, John Stott takes three pages. So if you really want the details, just talk to me and I'll give you a copy of that part, okay? But what I think he's saying here is, he's quoting you know, the Psalms you know, where the king is returning from war and is ascending into Jerusalem and he has all these captives and all this booty that he's taken in war and back home he's dispensing this largesse to, to, to the people back home. And the idea is that, that Jesus came, descended, and he, he defeated the, his enemies, Satan and the powers of evil and now he's returning and he is giving gifts to his people. I think that's what he said. Okay, so you won't blame me for, for skipping this, okay? <laughs> okay, then, now he talks about the diversity of gifts. And in verse 11 he says, so, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people uh, for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. <clears throat> okay, here again, you know, I don't have the time to develop each of these gifts, but uh, what he's saying is, I, you know, God, Christ has given certain core gifts, and uh, when he says apostles, there are churches today that have apostles, you know, and, and I don't think it's legitimate, because I think Part of the definition of an apostle is somebody who's seen the risen Christ. And there's nobody today alive who's seen the risen Christ. And so I don't think they, they, it's valid to say we still have apostles, but we still benefit. You know, they gave us the New Testament, the apostles and the prophets. You know, Paul says the church is founded on the you know, foundation of the apostles and the prophets, so we still benefit. And then there's evangelists, there's pastors, there's teachers. And what is their role? Now, the verse that follows you know, has been interpreted two different ways. You know, the old way, you know, in the Greek, it didn't have punctuation. 
and the Greek didn't have capital letters. You had to read, you know, you had to put it in the, the punctuation in the right place. And here's what the King James says. The King James says, and, and the King James you know, represents a whole philosophy of ministry. And the NIV or the modern translations represent a whole philosophy of ministry. In the King James, it says, he's given these gifts, you know, pastors, apostles, uh, teachers, and so on, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. According to the translation of King James, Christ has given these foundational gifts for three reasons. One is to perfect the saints. Second is to do the work of the ministry. The third is to edify the body. They have three jobs, pastors do. And for centuries, we've functioned that way, that it's the pastors that do the ministry. But a better way of punctuating this is like the NIV. And here it says, <clears throat> uh, he's given these particular gifts to equip his people for the work of service so that the body of Christ might be built up. In other words, Christ has given to his church certain foundational gifts in order that they might equip the rest of us so that we all might do the ministry of the body of Christ. And uh, that represents a whole different philosophy of ministry. And that's why, you know, in that bulletin in, in Connecticut, they said ministers, you know, uh, the entire congregation, okay? So uh, I'll come back to, you know, Paul doesn't elaborate too much on the spiritual gifts at this point, but he talks about, you know, its purpose, its function. And we'll come back to this question of spiritual gifts shortly. But uh, he goes on to say, until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of God and become mature, attaining to the full measure of the fullness of Christ. And so God has given the multiplicity of gifts. He's equipped every believer for ministry in order that <clears throat> uh, you know, we might come to the unity of the faith. You see, there's a foundational unity that we have just because we're in Christ. You know, one faith, one baptism, one Lord. But there's an ultimate kind of unity that comes through the ministry, the diversity of gifts. You know, it's possible in churches with different gifts to divide, that, that can divide people. Even in Corinth, it was dividing Christians. You know, but God's intention is that the multiplicity of gifts work together to build towards ultimate unity, unity of faith and practice. And uh, he goes on to say, <clears throat> to spell this out, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves um, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning craftiness of people uh, in their deceitful scheming. This is the goal of community. And he talks about, he talks about, you know, till we all come to maturity. Um, you know, in, instead of speaking the truth in love, we grow to become a very, in every respect, mature. And so God's intention is that we might be mature. And in this context, maturity isn't applied to us as individuals so much as to a whole church. You know, God's desire is to bring the church, the corporate you know, group, to a corporate maturity. <clears throat> Some of you know uh, Rick Warren you know, at Saddlebrack. You know, Rick Warren says his, inter his, his, his intention is that Saddleback Church be the most mature church in America. You know, I think that's an, a, a vision that every church should have. I think we should have that church vision, that our desire is that as a church, we become the most mature church in New Jersey. Okay? So, uh, <clears throat> and then he goes on, and he says, instead of speaking the, let's see, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, a mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. And so it's, it's almost as if he's saying, you know, Christ is the head, he's mature, but the body is not fully mature. And, you know, we are, you know, through the diversity of gifts, the body is growing and becoming mature so that it matches the head. And then he says, um, <clears throat> 
From him, the whole body joined and held together and every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love. Uh, as each part uh, does its work. And so love yo, know, and the diversity of gifts is building the body into a harmonious whole. You know, I've never ridden in a Ferrari, but I'm told that if you are in a Ferrari and you hear that motor purr, you know, that it's wonderful. And, uh, you know, that's what God intends for his church, that everybody is working together so much that things purr. And uh, in the Congo, a lot of, you know, missionaries used to have uh, Land Rovers. And uh, maybe you've seen the God who's, you know, must be crazy, you know, in the Land Rovers in those movies. <laughs> you know, and something about, you know, I never wanted a Land Rover because so much can go wrong. And there's rattles and creaks that come in. And I had a friend, a missionary friend, he says, he solves his rattles and creaks with a little oil. He just puts oil on all those rattles and creaks. Uh, and that's what love is. Love puts oil on all the rattles and creaks in the, in the, in the church. Okay, <laughs> so this is, uh, so that's sort of the context of spiritual gifts. Now, <clears throat> you know, the, I, hopefully in the fall we will have a whole seminar on spiritual gifts, okay? But I'm going to give you the whole seminar in five minutes, okay? So let me just talk a little bit about spiritual gifts. In the New Testament, there are three different passages that talk about spiritual gifts. There's this passage in Ephesians 4, and there's 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 13, and 14, and there's Romans 12. You know, Corinthians 12, Romans 12, easy to remember, right? And if you add up all the different gifts, you know, he talks about teaching gifts or helping gifts, administrative gifts, leadership, wisdom, knowledge, prophecy, tongues, miracles, you know, all those diversity of gifts. There's no complete list in any one of those places. And many uh, Bible scholars believe that Paul never intended to give a complete list, that these were just samples. And, you know, what is a spiritual gift anyway? I suggest to you that uh, a spiritual gift is when, when God, by his spirit, takes, you know, a particular ability and sets it on fire and uses it to build his church, okay? And there's a lot of things that the Holy Spirit will take and use to build his church. <clears throat> you know, some people ask, well, you know, what's the difference between a natural gift of teaching and a spiritual gift of teaching? I mean, there are a lot of people out there in, 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 the, in the world that are great teachers. You know, what's the difference between that gift of teaching and a spiritual gift of teaching? I suggest that the difference is that, you know, the Holy Spirit sets this gift on fire and uses it to build his church, okay? <laughs> Furthermore, I used to think that, you know, there's sort of spe the spectacular or spectacular or supernatural gifts and they're sort of ordinary gifts, like, you know, miracles or speaking in tongues or, or, or great faith and as over against, you know, something ordinary like, like helps or teaching or whatever. But actually, all of the gifts are supernatural because it's the Holy Spirit that energizes and uses it, okay? So uh, <clears throat> then there's a difference between identifying your gift or gifts, and developing that. You know, sometimes we see a kid, you know, maybe one of your kids, you know, and as they're growing up, you say, wow, he's got a talent for drawing, or she has a talent for, for music, uh, or he, you know, just everything he does, he can kind of fix things, okay? There's a difference between that natural gift and developing that gift and going and becoming a super mechanic or a great, you know, musician or whatever, because we develop. And then there's a difference between developing your gift and using your gift. There are people who have great gifts and they know what they are and they develop, but they haven't plugged it in yet. And, uh, and so uh, you know, maybe they haven't found the right slot or the right place to plug it in. So, uh, you know, all of these are just different aspects of, of spiritual gifts. And so that's a uh, that's five-minute seminar, okay? <laughs> but uh, let me go on and say that there's not only spiritual gifts, and, 
and in many respects in the New Testament, it's as if the spiritual gifts are designed mostly for internal, you know, building up the body of Christ, helping us mature. You know, there are some that, you know, I think that we can use these gifts in the, in the outside world, particularly the gift of evangelism. But there's also what we call callings. You know, what God calls you to. Now, in the olden days, and maybe it's still in the mentality of some people today, I know it's in the mentality of many Christians in the Congo, they see calling as, you know, there's a hierarchy of callings. You know, that up the top is the missionary, and then there's the pastor, and then, you know, there's the doctor and the teacher, and, you know, down here somewhere there's your know, businessman, and down here further is the politician, and way at the bottom is the farmer, you know, and in the Congo, they say that, you know, I'm only a farmer, you know, and farmer isn't like here with great combines and stuff. In the Congo, you have your hoe, and you have your plot of ground, and you are raising, you know, manioc, or you're raising sweet potatoes, and they say, I'm only a farmer, I'm only a gardener. And then I say to them, do you know what? That was the first calling. God called Adam to be a gardener. And the highest calling in life is God's calling to you. You know, what has God called you to? And so, you know, here are some of my props. You know, this is, uh, here's a book called The Call. And, uh, you know, it's written by Oskines, and you can get it on Amazon for an, a dollar and a half. And uh, it says, finding and fulfilling the central purpose of your life. A really great book on calling. And then, <clears throat> you know, we often, in the church, we talk about gifts and, you know, you know we have this insert about, uh, what, ministry opportunities, right? that long list of all these ways you can, and that's good, that's necessary, but all of that is built in, internal, and we rarely even talk about, you know, how can I be a better electrician as a Christian? And it doesn't mean that I just pray before my work, it means I'm a Christian in all my relationships, you know, or in the office, you know, how can I be, you know, a, a Christian in my office? And, and so, you know, one of the resources that I have here, and I listed at the bottom, is an article. And there's 10 copies back there, and we've run out of them. You just, just let me know, and I'll get some more copies for you. But it's entitled, The Workplace Priest, Activating Our God-Given Identity as Priests at Work. You know, not too long ago, I think a year or so ago, Joe Del Grande preached on, preached on how we are a kingdom of priests. Well, what does that mean in the workplace, in the world in which we live? You know, he spells some, some, some really good stuff on, on that. And then, I don't know if you've ever, ever uh, you read anything by Tim Keller, a pastor in New York City. You know, one of his books, you know, if you ever read one of his books, you'll be stuck for life. You'll want to read all of the others, Okay. And this is a book called Every Good Endeavor. And he entitles, the subtitle is Connecting Your Work to God's Work. Uh, and, and the course that we'll be offering in, this, in the fall on perspectives is actually part of this. You know, it sort of helps a person understand the, the big story that God is writing so that I can find out better, you know, how does God want to write my story into his story so that we're headed in the same direction, okay? Uh, so there's a lot of resources. And then there's, you know, what I, you know, there's one down here, a, a website, okay? I don't know if you've ever heard of the name Dennis Peacock. Anybody ever hear of Dennis Peacock? I didn't think so. My wife has, Okay. You've heard of Dennis Peacock? Okay. And Dennis Peacock, you know, he was at Berkeley when the students at Berkeley were reacting against the establishment in the 60s. And he was a part of the reaction. And he went to different religions seeking the truth, and finally God got a hold of him, and he became a believer. And 
if anybody in America understands American culture, Dennis Peacock does. And if anybody understands what it means to be a Christian in a pagan culture, Dennis Peacock does. And if anybody understands how to build a Christian business, Dennis Peacock does. And he has two courses at this site. One is called Strategic Life Training, and the other is called Business Leadership School. And each of these courses you know, are like a two-year course. You do it on, online, and they give you a mentor, and they give you stuff to read, and it's sort of an in-depth approach to, to growing as a disciple in a pagan culture and growing as, as, as an effective business person in, in a secular world. Okay, so uh, I'm at the end. Okay, but now I have some questions for you. Okay, um, <clears throat> we'll just take a few minutes, and I think we have a roving mic. Do we? Okay, great. Okay, and here's my questions. First off, you know, I want to give you a chance to, to react. Okay, maybe you, something struck you. Maybe you have something to add. Maybe you have a question. But basically, I want to ask you, how can we do better at moving people from the bleachers into the game? Okay, how can we do better? And, and some of you are already involved. Some of you are overcommitted. But, uh, but you know, some of you are in the bleachers, and you need to get into the game. Okay, how can we do better at moving people from the bleachers into the game? The second question is, how can we do better to equip you to make a difference in the world? You know, Christ has called us not only to be light in the world, but to be salt in the world, to change, you know, the, 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 the society, to, to give it flavor. You know, we not only have, have the evangelistic mandate, but in Genesis 1, we have the cultural mandate. God has commissioned mankind to be stewards of his creation. And so that's part of calling. Uh, <clears throat> so you know, there's sort of two kinds of, there's two approaches to the, the, the Christian and his role in the world. You know, one approach says <clears throat> you know, that the gospel is about rescuing people. You know, the, the house is on fire, the world is doomed, we want to rescue people and get them to heaven, okay? That's the rescue approach. There's an element of truth there, but that's not the biblical approach. The biblical approach is you know, that, <clears throat> that the gospel is a gospel of restoration. You know, the Bible did not begin with Genesis 3, the fall of man. The Bible began with Genesis 1, the creation, and God said it was good. And now with the fall and all that came, you know, the chaos that came, as God is in the process of restoring, of restoring. And he wants to include us in that process of restoring, um, not just getting out of life and getting. He's building, a, he's going to make and create a new heavens and a new earth, OK? Let me give you a chance to, <clears throat> to ask questions or to uh, tell me how we can serve you better in getting from the bleachers into <clears throat> onto the game or in being more effective in your ministry. Okay, we have the church secretary. <clears throat> oh, you can hear me? Um, uh, I don't know if it was last year or the year before at the Global Leadership Summit, there was a great presentation done on introverts. And some of us, like me, are very extroverted and you know, hear about an opportunity and go, yeah, I'll do that, yeah, I'll do that. But most of the people are not extroverts. And if we skip over them, we're skipping over great leadership and we're skipping over great talent and, and great contributions. Um, I know I've made an effort and I, I <laughs> um, encourage other extroverts to make an effort too that you know, when we see something going on in the church or, or we know that there's an opportunity to personally reach out to other people um, who may not, you know, may want to do something or wonder about something, but not be the type of person who would, you know, jump into it. Mm -hmm. To personally invite people to participate in things, whether it's an event at the church or a ministry or something, 
if you're extroverted, you know, look around and see who you can invite, you know, not only as a church, but as individuals within the church. I think that would help. Thank you. That's good. Uh, we need to get to know people better and know, not only ask people to step up and volunteer, but to go and say, you know, would you be willing to try this? And sometimes people are really honored to be asked. Any other uh, question or remark or suggestion? Yes. Thank you, and uh, you know, we need to do a much better job at communicating what the needs are, what's being talked about, what decisions are being made uh, to sort of uh, fit you into it. You know, in, in talking with uh, Sharon that works with uh, you know, the kids break along with uh, uh, Lisa, is it Lisa? Yeah, um, <clears throat> they, they said, you know, we have some people that are leaving us and we need some more, more teachers. And Sharon said, you know, I'd love to have some people just come and sit in and observe and see if this is for them. You know, and it doesn't have to be, you know, I'm volunteering for the rest of my life. You know, it's, it's coming, you know, and seeing, you know, is this for me? Am I, you know, is this something I could do? And, you know, maybe just try some things. Um, Lilla. <clears throat> We will, right, Samantha? <laughs> OK, one or two more comments, and then we'll uh, close. <clears throat> I don't know about anybody else, else's experience here with their faith, but I am, well, in the eyes of the Catholic Church, I'm a lapsed Catholic. I was raised Roman Catholic, and I have to say that in that religion, what I got was that the church is just, is the building. and. It is only in the last few years in coming to be a Christian mm -hmm. without the religious trappings that I've really come to know that we are the church and this is simply the building we come to to worship God. And I think that that is fundamental to almost everything that goes forth from there because kind of to dovetail with Lisa, Lisa said, if this isn't your home spiritually, if this isn't your spiritual family, and if you don't recognize that you and everyone else in this building is the church, then how do, how do you nurture and grow if you don't own that mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. the foundation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really important mm -hmm. component that the church, the church needs to teach mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the members, needs to teach the church. Every one of us mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is the church. Yeah. And not just when we sit here on Sunday for an hour and a half or two. Yeah, every yeah, walking yeah. moment, everywhere we go, everyone we meet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thanks. 
<clears throat> you know, we can't say you know, to the leaders, this is your church. You know, why don't you fix such and such? You know, rather, this is our church, you know, and uh, speak up and address it and make a difference. One more comment or question or... <clears throat> Okay, I think we have two more, right? Was there one over here? We'll accept you two. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say, I know a lot of the conversations have been about um, serving in church, mm -hmm. and so we want to bring that out of church. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that we can underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit. So if you start your day, if I start my day saying, Lord, I, don't, I, I have this and this and this on my agenda, Holy Spirit, where do you want to use whatever gifts I have that I don't even know I have, but how do you want to use me today? And you will find, we will find that the Holy Spirit will kind of put us next to somebody in the nursing home next to my dad that maybe needs a, a touch or will put me in line in front of somebody that I'll be sensitive to and I'll hear the Holy Spirit be like, you need to talk to that person. <laughs> so incorporating the Holy Spirit into your search for your using of your gifts is really important. Just ask him, Lord, how can you use me today? How can you use me in line here at the tire store or wherever you are? How can you use me? And you, it, God will answer that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, just to follow up a little bit on the family comment and the introvert comment, and as, as well as serving, I think we also have to start here. Um, sometimes introverts or people in families have been broken, so opening our eyes up first to the people around us that may be broken and may have come from experiences from other churches or fa broken families that we need to first look here and minister to each other before we can take that out into the community. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Let's close in prayer. And then uh, Larry will take over and uh, close our meeting. But <clears throat> thank you, Lord, for, for saving us. And you saved us to serve you. And uh, we pray that you'd help us in figuring out what that means for each one of us and for us as a church. And uh, I just pray that, uh, that you'd help each of us to, 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 to identify what is the next step for me. You know, rather than try and do everything at once. Uh, so we thank you for your word. We thank you that these, these responsibilities that you give to us are part of your grace. You know, you've deigned it that we, mortals, weaklings, you know, imperfect people, should participate with you in what you're doing in the world and in the universe. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.